Well, glory to God. Are you glad to be here today? If you're joining us on FATV, welcome. We're sure glad you're taking this time to join us from your home as you uh, watch this sermon and consider what God has to say to you. God knows you're watching. God has something in this message to say right to you. So sit down and get your Bible out, get a notebook out to take some notes. And in fact, if you'd like a copy of this message, just contact us at the address at the end of the broadcast. We'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. Glory to God. Well, I, I got a simple, quick message we're going to get into today. And I'm going to give you the title before we begin. What have you done? <laughs> what have you done? What have you done? You know, as, as is so typical, uh, Donna began to, to touch around my sermon again when she got up here this morning. And, and when she started talking about the fact that we're going to stand accountable. And that's true. We are. We're going to stand accountable. As we talk about coming up to a higher level, it's a higher level of accountability. But it's also a level in which you and I are going into a position where the kingdom of God becomes something that is easy to live, not difficult. You know when you're in rebellion to God, living in the kingdom is difficult. Do You know when you're caught up in the trap of the world, living in the kingdom is very difficult. But it's kind of like breaking the sound barrier. Once that jet gets through that sound barrier, on the way through it, there's a lot of shaking, a lot of rattling, but you get on the other side of it, and it's very peaceful. Think about that. For years, men thought they couldn't break the sound barrier. As they got closer to it, the plane would shake and the plane would rattle. And, and the test pilots were considered the most courageous men for trying to break that because the image was you're just going to blow up. The, the plane as it gets to that, you're just going to fall apart and, and what are you doing? But when they first punched through that sound barrier, they found out all of a sudden everything became smooth. And all the noise was where? Behind them. Do, do, do you understand that principle? Do we want to have a science class? It's kind of like the two ladies who got on the airplane and said to the stewardess, is the jet going to go faster than the speed of sound? And the, and the lady the stewardess said, no, no, ma'am, it's, it's not going to do that. She said, oh, good, because we want to be able to talk to each other. <laughs> See, when you're going faster than the speed of the sound, the, 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 the sound is back there, you're ahead. Have you ever stood sometimes, and this has nothing to do with the speed of the sound, but, but the the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. That's why when you look up, you see the jet here, but you hear the sound coming behind it. That's not because it's going faster than sound. It's that light, the light of the plane that you can see reflected as you see it travels faster than sound. And so the light where the, where the plane is reaches you quicker. But when you go faster than the speed of sound, then everything is behind you. You know, when you shift into the kingdom of God, doesn't mean there's not evil, doesn't mean there's not challenges, but they fall behind you faster than they come. Like water off a duck's back, so to speak. You know, you're never going to live a life without challenges, but what about if the challenge comes, it's gone. It comes, it's gone. It comes, it's gone. It comes, it's gone. You're just staying ahead of the challenges. Glory to God. See, that's the kingdom of God here and now that Yeshua kept talking about. I want to read one of Yeshua's parables to you, and it's in Matthew 25, very familiar. Uh, it's in the King James, it's called the parable of the talents. In the NIV, it's called the parable of the bags of gold. Well, take it talents, take, take it gold. If you read the Message Bible, it'll talk about it in dollars. This is in the series of, of um, the, uh, when Yeshua's talking about end times, uh, beginning in chapter 23, and if you have a red letter Bible, you can just turn and there's page after page after page. All in red letters mean Yeshua is doing a lot of talking here. And in chapter 3, he's warning about a hypocrisy. And then he's talking about watching out for the, uh, the, the uh, teachers of the law who are actually teaching tradition rather than the law. Then he, in chapter 24, he starts talking about the destruction of the temple. And what are the signs of the end times? Uh, and the fact that that's an unknown thing, but it's coming and he gives us the signs. Then we get to chapter 25, and he talks about the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, the sheep and the goats, 
All of these are parables of end times telling us there is a coming judgment, there's a coming separation, there will be people who are in and people who are out. You know, Yeshua never was one of these, these teachers that said, well, God in the end, everybody red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. Well, everybody is precious in his sight, but not everybody's going to be in his presence. And, and if you've got a view of, of Yeshua that says, well, you know, Jesus was, so, he just taught us how to be good Christians. In the end, everybody goes to heaven. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. Someone told you something that wasn't in the Bible because the Bible doesn't say that. Three chapters, Yeshua is teaching about the end times and talking about accountability, uh, talking ab about those who are going to be in and those who are going to be out. He talks about it in terms of individuals and he talks about it in terms of nations. So in chapter 25, let me read to you uh, from the NIV uh, in uh, beginning at verse 14. Again, again, in other words, Yeshua is saying the same message with a whole variety of, of parables to try to get them to understand. Again, it will be, what will be? The end time judgment, the time when there's going to be an accountability for your life. And if you're watching us by TV today, let me say that to you. There will be an accounting for your life. You will stand before Almighty God, the creator of all that is, was, and ever will be. And you will give an account for what you did with your life. Specifically, you and I will give an account for what we did with the offer of salvation through his son Yeshua. Did we receive his gift or did we reject his gift? It's not a matter of what denominational title you have, not a matter of, well, did you do more good than bad? It is an, a matter of what did you do with what God said. You and I together will stand accountable for that. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, say long time, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The master returned and settled accounts with them. I don't think I need to explain in detail that this is a message about Yeshua himself going, leaving something with us, and he's going to come back and settle accounts with you and me as to what we did. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take 
the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And throw that wicked servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as we would say in the liturgical church, thus endeth the reading of the gospel. <laughs> What's gospel mean? Good news. Thus endeth the reading of the Good news. Anybody, as you're listening to that, say, I'm jumping out of my seat because it was good news? <laughs> you know, th this passage rarely gets preached upon because it doesn't fit in our politically correct atmosphere. Boy, just the way he says it makes us squirm in our seat. It doesn't sound fair. Well, who are we talking about? See, you make your decision, the Bible is the word of God. You make your decision that Yeshua is the son of the living God the Messiah that has been sent to earth to save us, then you read what he says. I always say, make your decision the Bible's true, then read it. Don't read it to see if it's true. Because there are things in that word that are going to confront your education smack dab. They're going to confront your attitudes and what your mama believed and what your daddy believed and what your friends believed. That Bible is going to slam into your personal beliefs Every time you turn a page, there is something there ready to confront you, and you're going to have to make a decision. Are your ways and thoughts right, or are God's? Your ways, says Abba, are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. And when we come to this, I, I'll tell you, you know, there are Christians who don't even know Yeshua said this. They've gone to church all their life. Never heard this. Don't read their Bible, so they haven't read it. That the one who has will be given more, and the one who has nothing will lose what little he had. Boy, what do we do with that? Put that in your welfare pipe and smoke it. Come on. You see, when, when, when I hear socialists, and I hear Democrats, and yeah, I'm going to call them because that's who they are, Go around and say we need to take from the wealthy and give to the poor. That is a non-biblical teaching. It contradicts the teachings of Yeshua himself right there. For a simple reason. Now, I didn't intend to go down this, but Holy Spirit's telling me to do it. Because you, you need an economic lesson. Listen, when you take away from the rich to give to the poor, you're giving to the ones who will not increase it. They will bury it and absolutely be consumers. Always give me, give me, give me, give me. But if you give it to those who are already producers, they will produce more. They'll produce more jobs. They'll pr produce more opportunities for growth. They'll produce the jobs that those who don't have them need. That's right. That's right. That's right. Biblical economics, very straight from the, from the mouth of the master himself, but pastors won't read it. Pastors won't read that. They don't want to stand in the pulpit and say that. Glory to God. This is Jesus. Well, I don't like it. Then you don't like Jesus. I think it's wrong. Then you're rejecting God. Don't tell me you're a Christian and you're rejecting the very teaching of Jesus. Well, I think you're wrong. You're thinking he's wrong. Then he's not your Savior. He's not your... Well, I said a prayer. Doesn't mean anything. Yeshua says in the end times, people are going to come and say, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We were deacons in the church. We were leaders in the church. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. What kinds of people are those? People who reject his teachings like this. Who will walk into a voting booth and vote for someone who says, take from the poor, I mean, take from the rich and give to the poor, when Yeshua says, no, you don't do that. And then have the audacity to say, the Bible supports my socialistic views. No, it does not. No, it does not. Now, that's not where I'm going with this today, but you need to understand that. Amen. 
Now, what did he say? Well, that just doesn't sound right. Think about it. If you keep taking from the man that has the ten and you give it to the man who buried it, the man who buried it, it never grows. He'll bury the ten if you gave him ten. If you gave him twenty, he'll bury it. By the way, the master knew that. That's why he only gave him one. <laughs> Come on. I wish God would give me more. What are you doing with what you have? Amen. If you can't be trusted with what you have, why give you more? You can just get in debt at a deeper level. Come on. This, this country doesn't even begin to understand this. We have no accountability in the nation because we as people have no accountability. Come on. Seven years ago, the national debt was $3 trillion. It's now $17 trillion. That's inconceivable. You know, under a, a man who said, I'm going to get the economy under control, $17 trillion. It's, it's, it's a, a freight train out of control that is absolutely going to end in financial disaster. In this. It's going to. That's not a doomsday property. It's, it's like, come on. Except when you go bankrupt, you file for bankruptcy, and we have crazy laws that say you never have to pay it. Where does the government go when it gets bankrupt? Where's the government go when the Chinese suddenly say, we want our money for all the bonds that you've got? Oh, you don't have it? Well, great, we'll take your buildings, we'll take your government, we'll take your this. By the way, we'll just move over here and now we, the Chinese, will run your, your country because we own it. Glory to God. So Yeshua is teaching a principle here of uh, accountability. At the end, you and I are all going to be asked to stand accountable for what have we done with what he gave us. And, and notice what happened. The message, by, by the way, says to one he gave $5,000, to another 2000 and to a third, 1000 depending on their abilities. Now listen, God gives to you and me according to abilities. That's right. Abilities doesn't mean you're limited. You can always grow your abilities. Amen. Amen. But God is going to start with where you are. He's not going to give you a big faith project if you're a person of little faith. Amen? He's going to teach you how to turn little faith into big faith. How do you turn little faith into big faith? You use it. You use it. You plant it, it'll grow. You plant it, it'll grow. Well, I only have a little bit of faith. Fine, find one little thing that you can apply faith to and, and then, then grow. That's why as parents, you know, if we learn one... One lesson it would be to teach our children faith. Quit giving them things. Right. Quit giving your children things. Because right. you're not teaching them how to believe God for things. Yeah, right. Oh, mommy gave me this, and mommy gave me that, and mommy gave me this, and daddy gave me this, and I have this toy, and that toy, and this toy, and the newest this, and the newest this. That is not the real world. The only world that has that expectation that that somebody's always going to give you is the world of welfare. Well, the government will give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. And by the way, that's a Ponzi scheme that eventually runs out. Teach your children to have faith. Teach them how to apply faith. What do you want? I, you know, I, I really would like to have a new this or a new that. Fine, apply your faith to it. Believe for it. Start confessing for it. Parents think they're helping their children when they're giving. You're destroying your children's faith Building opportunities. Very simple. Well, I, I, I didn't have much. I want them to have, have more. You see how we got sucked into a, an economy, a, a worldly view that isn't teaching them how to ever get in their life. And so generation after generation, Christians are becoming weaker, weaker, weaker. Even in so-called faith circles, the children of the faith giants are not nearly the giants their parents were. Because they were given things. That mom and dad used faith and produced a, a, you know, a, an abundance of income and then just started giving, 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 giving to their children and their children didn't learn how to believe God for it. Which is kind of scary because then how are you going to get through the difficult times of life? Amen? So in this parable, Yeshua is clearly indicating you and I are going to stand accountable. 
for whatever you have. You're not going to be measured by anyone else. Well, uh, Timothy, you know, uh, what did you do? You know, I'm measuring you uh, according to Pastor Don. He's not going to measure him according to Pastor Don. You know, he, he's not going to say, well, you know, I expect you to do everything that Pastor Don did. Pastor Don may have had opportunities in life that he didn't have, may have had uh, opportunities to grow, opportunities to learn things. And God comes along and says, here, I want to use your talents. He goes to Timothy and says, I want to use your talents where you are. What have you done with what I gave you where you are? Well, you know, if, if, if I could be a this, I'd be great. No, that's not where you are. What have you done where you are? Well, if, if I could be the head of the company, why don't you uh, be the good janitor that you are? See, because if that's your job, the janitor, and you do it unto the glory of God, you'll get promoted. But if you stay as a janitor, always saying, I should be the CEO, I could be better, you end up with a grousing, complaining attitude. God can't even use the talent you have. You cease even becoming a good janitor. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. According to the talent you have, you and I are going to be held accountable. You're never going to be held accountable to Donna Long's faith. Well, here's her faith. No, no, no. What did you do with the measure of faith he gave you? Because we're all given faith, but, but what did you do? What you're seeing in her is simply she planted it, grew, planted it, it grew, planted it, it grew, planted it, it grew. You know, if, if you're not planning your faith, then it stays this small thing. And in the area of faith, that parable makes perfect sense. Because the one who has faith will get more faith. It becomes this reproducing thing. And the one who won't even use their little bit of faith, guess what? They end up losing it all together and they become faithless. See, so you either grow in the body of Christ or you drop out. Glory to God. Uh, you know, if I had a had a dollar for every person that sat for at least a year under my teaching over 40 years of ministry, I'd probably be a wealthy man. People who went around, and when I was pastor in a church with 300 people every Sunday, and man, they're all excited about, I keep running into them and say, where do you go to church? Well, they don't even go to church anymore. What happened? What happened? I mean, how, how, how do you walk away from the Word? How do you walk away from Yeshua? Well, I was disappointed in this person or that. Well, where did a person ever come to be disappointing you so much that you, you walk away from the Word? You walk away from what the Bible says. And then I listen to their talk, and it's filled with negative. I can't this, I can't this. Wait a minute, you sat there for two years learning about the power of your tongue, what you say, what you confess, but there you are now not confessing it at all. People who come and say, Yay, Pastor, this is so great. The Bible so clearly teaches about Sabbath. And then they leave, and with them leave Sabbath. Well, you, were, were you, you, you did, I guess you never embraced it. You, th you never grabbed it because if you saw it from the Bible, it's always going to be a part of your life. How do you walk away from those things? You still with me? So note this. Note that the one with the 10,000 and the one with the 5,000 uh, doubled the amount and returned twice to the master. And the result was that they were invited to enter their master's happiness. You ever think about that? Enter my joy. Enter my happiness. What have you done with your life? Well, you know, I did this, and here's what I got to return you. Wow, that is great. Come enter my happiness. Tells me that Yahweh is happy with prosperity. Ha Yahweh is happy when you expand. Yahweh is excited. Come on. When your life is being invested in the lives of other people and bearing fruit. And he offers you his eternal happiness for it. Glory to God. I don't want God to just say, well, okay, you're in. I, I want him to be happy that I'm there. God danced the day you were born. Amen? Glory to God. The master's filled with joy over growth. Now, with that expectation, he would have equally taken joy if the man with the one talent had simply said, look, I put it to work and I have two. I think he would have been happy if the man said, look, I put it to work, I got one and a half. You know, I, I, I put it to work and there was some growth to it. What did the master say? At least you could have put it in the bank and earned interest, which wouldn't have even been half. 
If you'd even come back and said, look, I, I didn't invest the way I, I, I wasn't smart, I didn't learn from mentors, I didn't let anyone teach me, but I at least put it in the bank, here's your 3% interest. He, he would have been happy. He would have been happy, but the man did nothing with it. He buried it and refused to accept the obligation on his life to produce something for what his master had done for him. The vast majority of Christians in the world, but especially America, never tell another person how to give their life to Jesus. Vast majority. They stand there, do you have anyone that you, you witness to and say, well, here's my brother, here's my sister, here's, here's somebody that I shared Jesus with them and they accepted him, and, and Lord, you gave your life to me, and I'm bringing another one with me. Vast majority have no one to bring. No one they can point to and say, Lord, I, I, I gave my life, and, and I was so filled with appreciation that I talked to people about you, and look, here's one, here's two, here's three who have come into the kingdom because I was so grateful for what you gave me. Shame on us, church. Glory to God. Returning only what you were given results in condemnation. You and I are expected to bring a return on the investment of the talents in your life. You are accountable to do something with your life. Is the place you work better because you're there? Is the neighborhood in which you live better because you're there? See, is, is, is that the attitude with which we approach that I am going to live a life of excellence that that teacher in school, because I was a student, will say, I was so glad to have you as a student. Or that student in school will be Say, I'm so glad I had you as a teacher because you gave me not just a lesson, but you poured your life into me. You, made, you brought value to me because you were my teacher. Is the employer blessed because you're an employee giving into the success of that business? Is that employee blessed because as an employer you have an attitude to give into the life of that employee so that when you come here, when you leave, you're better because you worked for me. I was asked when I was in the high-tech industry as a manager by my group one time, what do you consider your job is as a manager? I said, my first job as a manager is to make sure that when the time comes, should you choose to leave this organization, that you are better equipped, better able to get ahead because you spent these years with me than if you had not. That's my job. My job isn't as a manager to make sure you all make me look good. My job is not to make sure you all do your, your job so well that when it comes bonus time, I, the manager, get a bigger bonus than all of you, who, by the way, did the work. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. You're a manager, you've got responsibilities. But my responsibility as a manager is to ensure that if you come and work under me for three years, when you leave, you're always able to say, you know, I, I thank God that Don Long was my manager because he taught me this, he believed in me, he, he gave me the skills, the training, opportunities that I never had before. I had such a manager, one, <laughs> In, in, in my high-tech career, and, and it's like, I mean, he marked my life. He taught me things I needed to know. I mean, he, he gave of himself to me, you know? And so he's, he's always in my mind to be highly respected because it wasn't about what can I do for him. It was an attitude of what could he do to teach me, to, to lead me along. Are, are you understanding this? You and I are going to be accountable for what have we done. Glory to God. Back when I worked as a janitor, my job is to make the place the, the cleanest I can so everybody feels good. You know you feel better if you're in a clean building than a dirty one? 
You know, you walk in a building and the, and the floors are shiny and bright and everything. You feel better about yourself. Because you feel better about yourself, you're going to be a better worker that day because you're working in a place that makes you feel good. How important is the janitor? Come on. And if a janitor says, I'm, I'm doing this building unto the Lord, it's not like, uh-oh, next week the team from the headquarters is coming to inspect everybody. we got to clean up. But it's always clean. Headquarters can walk in any day, open the door and go, Wow, 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 I am, I just feel good in here. Amen? Glory to God. People would, we've told you this over the years, people would come into our house in Hubbardston, here in Fitchburg as well, but they would come in, workmen, coming in to fix things, you know, with their pants, you know, hanging down off the back, you know, I mean, really, earthy workmen, and they'd come in, and the front door of that split, and they'd open the door, and they'd be there talking to us for a minute, and all of a sudden they'd start looking around. They, this, this is... This is, a, this is a really nice house you got here. You're in the foyer of a simple little split. This is not like, you know, wow, look at the chandelier. And then pretty soon someone would begin to identify. You know, it, it just smells so nice in here. It feels. You know, here's a plumber saying, it just feels good in here. What is a plumber talking about? It feels good. You know, they were looking for words because there was an atmosphere in that house that Donna worked all the time to maintain because at any time someone could step in the door and what are they going to feel? The presence of God or a very worldly place? Is the sound of worldly music and, and all the garbage on TV filled the atmosphere and so it's just as tense in that house as elsewhere? Or is the Word of God floating around? Is there music playing? Is there, you know, what is it that you know, you're presentable at any time? God gave her that house. So she made that house an offering to God. <laughs> the result is she got a bigger one. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You're still with me. So let me make an excursion for a moment. Is that okay? This isn't my point of where I want to end up on, on the sermon, but I, I do have to say this, because if you have one talent, you are going to be held accountable for what did you do with that one talent. Turn to somebody and say one talent. Everybody's got at least one talent. And you're going to be held accountable for what you did with your one talent. Well, let me tell you something else, people. Every one of you have been given one vote. We live in a democracy. Not everybody does. There's a lot of people in this world who are not responsible for a vote because they don't have a vote. They live in a dictatorship or they live in who, who knows what kind of a, a society where they don't have that. But we live in a country that was blessed to understand democracy and we all have been given one vote. And whether you know it or not, you and I, and if you're listening on TV, you as well, are going to stand accountable for Almighty God for what you did with the talent called a vote. Amen. Amen. Did you use it? Did you use it wisely? Did you use it in a way that would enhance the kingdom of God? Or did you bury it? Did you bury it and say, well, I, I, I'm just not going to do this? And, and people will say, but, but pastor, it's just one vote. It's just one vote. What can one vote do? Let me give you an example David Barton gave. He's on TV with um, Pastor George. Um, who else is there? Bishop Butler and, and Kenneth Copeland uh, on B Believer's Voice of Victory. They have a two-week broadcast on the, on the election, on what's going on. But he, he, David Barton, who's probably the preeminent, I believe, historian of America, in America today. If this were to represent all the eligible voters in America, and at this coming election it will be true of, as it is in most, one-third of eligible voters are not even registered. So we can take a third and rip it off, because they don't even count. Okay, uh, about one third of those who are registered do not vote in presidential elections. So we can take a third of what's left. They don't even vote in the election. And then in many elections, and I think this is certainly going to be one, of the, the popular vote is is not going to be 80% to 20%. It's going to be floating around a little over 50 and a little under 50. 
which means half of those left actually are the ones who have decided who the president of the United States is going to be. So out of this many people who could vote, this many people determine who our president is. D democracy is majority rule. This isn't a majority by any stretch of the imagination. In, uh, in fact, what it turns out to be in, in, in an election is one-fifth of eligible voters actually elect the man who's going to be president. One-fifth. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. Let's round it to twenty-five. Five of us get to decide who the president's going to be. So, here, here's five of us. Sorry about the rest of you, you don't count. Newkirk and Jesse and Tim and Donna and I, we're going to be the ones that decide who the most significant player in American politics is going to be, and the rest of you are going to live with our decision. Now, I think we're pretty smart. You might say, that's okay, we trust you. <laughs> but maybe you wouldn't, okay? One-fifth of eligible voters are actually going to determine who the president is. When you get in an off year, uh, when a president isn't being voted for, then it turns out to be one-sixth to one-seventh. When you get down to the election of governors and local officials, when it's not in a presidential year, where you're, you're going to the poll for the president, you might vote for the governor and everybody else too, but when it's just for local officials, the, it's this amount. Actually, yeah, it was, it was probably about half of that, wasn't it? Just tiny little piece is actually the number of eligible voters in a city and those who actually are determining who runs the city is this. And yet everybody has the power to vote. Well, the difference, the question is, well, what, what, what can happen with one vote? Listen to this. November 4th, 2015, in that election, Ohio Secretary of State John Husted pointed out that the general election included 21 races or questions in which the vote was close enough to trigger an automatic recount. 21, either questions on the ballot or races for whatever office, 21 of them had to be recounted simply because they were that tight. Seven local issues in Ohio ended in a tie or were decided by a single vote. One single vote made the difference. Can you imagine if you and your friend decided not to vote and you were against that thing and it passed by one vote, if the two of you had gone, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have passed. What, what, what is the value of, of one vote? Vermont State Representative Sidney Nixon in 1997 won his seat by a one vote margin 570 to 569. In the whole state of Vermont, and that whole district, less than 1,100 people voted. And the election was won by one vote. On election night in 1997, South Dakota Democrat John McIntyre held a razor-thin lead of four votes over Republican Hal Wick, for the second seat in Legislative District 12. A recount, however, found that Wick had won 4,192 to 4,191. That's a little over 8,000 votes. Come on, Pastor, 8,000 people are voting. What difference does my vote make? In that election, one vote would have changed it. 8,000 votes were cast but it was so close that one voted, one vote decided who got in or who didn't get in. A Lansing, Michigan school district proposition to raise the tax for supporting the school failed in 1989 when a final count yielded a tie vote of 5,147 for and 5,147 against. A tie vote. 
Well, they wanted to change the rate they were going to charge, but because they didn't win, they couldn't change the rate. One, I mean, over 10,000 people voted in that. One vote could have made the difference. You say, well, you know, I mean, what, what difference did it mean? In that case, it meant that the school district, as a result, had to reduce its budget by $2.5 million. Now, I, I'm not saying right or wrong on the issue. All I'm saying is one vote difference and the school district could have gone on with its plans, but short of one vote. Absolutely amazing. What does, what does my one vote do? Now, if that's true in the natural realm of voting, what do you think your one vote does in the realm of the Spirit? Come on. Prophet Elijah goes and, and the whole nation is turned to Baal's. He said, fine, let's have a contest. Let's get all the priests of Baal and go to Mount Carmel. You've been there with me. And we're going to go to Car Mount Carmel. And we're going to find out who is God. One man and hundreds of priests of Baal. And they're up there and they're crying out and doing all the things. God, light our fire, light our fire, light our fire. And it doesn't light up. Remember, Elijah kind of begins to mock him. He said, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe you need to yell more, you know. Uh, and... and you know the story. After they've exhausted everything and it doesn't work, he stands up, one man. God, demonstrate who's God. Stands back, boom. The whole altar is consumed. The water in the altar is consumed. The offering is consumed. And what do all the people do? Now, wait a minute. Just a minute ago, all the people were standing around, thousands of them. You know, they're all Baal worshipers. They've all rejected the word of God. See, a, a democracy might run by a vote, but in the realm of the Spirit, one person can triumph. Hmm? And they all fell on their face. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. There can be a revival in this nation. But what unleashes the power is the power of you. It's not that your one vote, in fact, may make a difference in terms in the natural, but your one vote can make an eternal difference in the realm of the spirit. That's right. I can see the devil marching into the kingdom of heaven. All right, the election's won. My candidate won. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue to take America down a bad road and, 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 uh, because I have a majority. He's going to say, no, no. In the realm of the spirit, I don't need 5 million people, 4 million people. I just need all my people to vote for God. <laughs> and that gives me the authority to enter into the scene. You plus God are a majority. You plus God are a majority. Your faith plus God overrides medical decisions. Your faith by God plus God override any, any financial a handicap the bank has said you have. Come on. Your, your, your vote plus God triumphs over what your family history has been. Your vote, God, I'm going to vote for you. You say I've been forgiven, I'm forgiven. Your vote plus God eradicates all that the enemy has done in your life all your life. Well, God, I got this list. He did, he did, he did, he did. She did, she did, she did. She did, I got this long list. It's like toilet paper, just rolls, you know? And, and, and it's like, but you stand up and say, I believe I'm saved by the blood of Yeshua. I believe that the atonement was paid for me. I believe that I am washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you plus God erase all those other votes. Amen. You know, we had a, we have a little piece of land, some, some of you don't know that. We have a little plot of land over on Redmond Street that we picked up for a future parking lot if we need it. Somebody dumped a couch in it. So it's been sitting there for a long time and, and, and it's fi finally I got around to doing it. When I said I got around to doing it, the health department called and said, you need to get around to do it. <laughs> you know, so I did. So I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm gonna put a sign up there just to tell people, you know, Look, no dumping, private property, you know, you're, we're, we're, we're going to uh, prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. So I got the sign. And that's what's going over there. And then I thought, 
We, we ought to put on our front door. When the devil comes to you and wants to dump on you, absolutely no dumping, devil. You will be prosecuted to the full extent of the Torah. Absolutely no dumping, devil. If you need a small one, make it and put it in your pocket. And when you're going around all of a sudden, the devil, well, you did, and you didn't do, and you're this, and you're that. Whip it out. Absolutely no dumping, devil. <laughs> I will prosecute you to the full extent of the law, and the law says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. I'm not saying I didn't do that. I'm not saying I didn't sin. I am saying there's no condemnation because it's between me and him, not between you and me. No dumping. No dumping. No dumping. No dumping. Wouldn't that make a great message? I might preach a whole message on that sometime. No dumping. You know what, what, what verse are you using? I'm using um, Greiner signs. Um, one, one. Uh, absolutely no dumping. Absolutely no dumping in my life. I mean, what if you had a sign like this and one of your friends comes up, a relative, and they start to dump. Whip it out. No dumping. No dumping in my life. What do I look like? I'm not a cesspool. I'm not a vacant yard. I'm not the dump. No dumping, no dumping, no dumping. Come on. I, I, I mean, I think some of you need to do this. You have people who dump in your life. Get one. No dumping. You can smile. Come on. Glory to God. Uh, I don't know how I got into that, but anyway. <laughs> so, so listen. If there's one vote in the natural realm, what is your vote count in the, in, the, in the realm of the Spirit? Now, if those who call themselves Christians truly believe the Bible was the word of the living God of creation and have voted in alignment with what the Bible says, we would have an entirely different nation. An entirely different nation. This nation, this nation would be changed within, within one year if every Christian simply voted by the Bible. You know, everything that's would come back up for grabs and everything would go on the docket and and even in a state like Massachusetts That's right. I'm convinced as, as as liberal as Massachusetts is if everybody who says they're a Christian voted by the what the Bible says this Commonwealth would turn around Amen. yeah but the Supreme Court Supreme Court would turn around Amen. if everybody voted according to the Bible then our Congress would change in, within two elections, we'd have the entire House of Representatives filled with people who would support what the Bible says. Well, yeah, but the Supreme Court, with a Congress changed, we would impeach those ju justices in the Supreme Court who are anti-God. We're not, we're not, we don't have to live with it. it well, the Constitution, yeah, but the Constitution provides a way for us to get people off that bench who believe that marriage should be between um, a man and a man should be okay. How would you just throw out all the rights of we the people? Where did we ever get to the point where the vast, vast majority, 4% of Americans are driving the, the sexual agenda in America, 4%. And judges are lining up. Now, in some states, by the way, judges are elected. They're not in Massachusetts. But judges are elected in many of the Midwest states. And boy, well, I tell you, judges are being bounced off benches now in the Midwest. Because they're taking these radical things. The people are saying, that's not what we want for our judges. We want judges with a standard of morality we the people believe is the right standard of morality. We don't want a judge who supports some normal, uh, some minority morality and then tells us all we have to abide by it. Amen. You know, if, 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 if that's where, where the nation is, it's there because we haven't risen up and voted. But quite apart from the natural, what are you doing with your voice? You've been given one voice. I think at that level we're probably all the same if we looked at it simply as our natural voice. If we looked at, at opportunities, you have a talent of a voice you can use where I can't. Come on. Your, your voice can go places my voice can't go. Okay? Uh, Desi's in college. I don't have a voice on that college. She does. I don't have a voice in that class. 
Hmm? Vicki works in a law office. She has a voice in there. They, they don't know my voice. If I stood at the door outside and said, hey, it's me, they would say, who? <laughs> they would say, oh, it's Pastor Don. They, they, they don't know my voice. I don't have a voice in that law office. Therefore, I don't have a voice into the lives of everybody that comes into that law office. You understand what I'm saying? Come on. A Asia works in a hospital with, with new moms in, in, in nursing, um, breastfeeding instructions and all that kind of stuff. I mean, not just a few. She touches more women in, in a week than I would touch all year in terms of my voice being able to impact. She has a voice. I don't have one voice, but, but what a place to use that voice. You have a voice. Your voice is available to use where my voice cannot be. Huh? I have opportunities you don't have. My voice is going over the, the, uh, the airwaves, and people are sitting in, the, in a house listening to my voice. They're not going to hear your voice. They're going to hear my voice. And so the question is, what are we going to do with the talent that we have? And if we're going to step up to another level, which we are going to, then I suggest to you, you're going to have to start getting a view. I am going to be accountable at the end of this journey. What have I been done with what I have? Have I buried it? Have I said, well, I don't talk about these, or I'm not comfortable, or I'm not gifted? No. God gave you a voice. If we're to move to the next level, to a higher standard of life, which Yeshua called the kingdom of God, a dimension of life that's possible right here and now, we're going to have to stop navel-gazing. Is that okay to use? Focusing on our own needs, our wants, our desires, what I want, give me this, give me this, oh God, I need, I need. And we're going to have to start investing our life and our talents, if you will, in the cause of the Messiah. That's why we're here. That's our only purpose to be here. We will stand before the Lord and answer his questions, and he's going to ask, what did you do with your one vote? What did you do with your one voice? What did you do with your one life I gave you to live? No one else can live it. I gave it to you to live. Am I to be happy if all you give me is what I gave you? Where's the return on my investment in you? I gave everything for you. What have you given for me? And that's the phrase that Donna used at the beginning. Where is his investment? In us. He poured out his life so we can live etern for eternity. Where's the return? Abba, I spoke. Abba, I said. Abba, when people said there was no God, I said, I beg to differ with you, there is a God. When people said, well, well, God took this person's life, Abba, I stood up for you and said, God is not the taker of life, it's the devil who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. My God is one who comes to give life and give abundantly. I stood up for you. When people said, well, Israel is nothing, I stood up for your people and your land because you said that if I'll speak for your land and your people, then you will honor me. I, I used my voice when I didn't say, well, I don't want to get somebody mad at me. I stood up for you. If they seem smarter than me, I didn't care about that. I said what I know. And when they said you have to die, I said it's not your decision whether or not I have to die. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I shall live and not die. When the evil report comes, Abba, I use my voice. When discouragement came, I used my voice and I spoke and encouraged myself. I quoted your scriptures until I was picked up back to where I belong. When the evil reports have come, I spoke the positive good report of God. Can we stand together as a congregation and do that? And that's our goal. See, Donna and I have a goal that we all, you and us, get to a level where... Having arrived at that level and embraced it in our life, we could all stand before Yeshua. And I know we're all going to be accountable individually, but I'd like to believe that like God singled out tribes and he called the tribe because he gave things to the tribe, that, that after we've gone through that individual accountability, you know, I can just see the angel blows the shofar. And off goes the shofar. Matter of fact, who's got a shofar here? Go, go give a blow on that shofar. Just give a sound. It's the end times. And we're all gathered and we're all excited because guess what? <laughs> we're all there. I said we're all there. 
Is that, come on, we're all there. Okay? And all of a sudden, an angel steps front stage and blows the shofar. And center stage is Yeshua. And another angel steps forward. I'm calling for the tribe of faith Christian Church of Fitchburg. Please come forward. And we get up out of our seat. Come on. <laughs> you know? and, and everybody gets up. And everybody starts moving. And, 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 you know, we've been through the individual. Come on, come on. You've got to get this picture. We get to the individual thing and we're coming up. New Kirk. Ah! New Kirk, you made it. You know? oh, oh, oh. Paul, you made it. You made it in. You're here. Nobody's going to be at that time saying, oh, good to see you. Oh, I, I, I wasn't sure if you'd make it or not, but I'm glad to see you're here. I, 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 know, I know there's going to be a judgment of individuals. I know there's going to be a judgment of nations. <laughs> but I'd like to believe there's going to be a judgment of tribes. And we are the tribe of Faith Christian Church on 40 Bowtell Street in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and we've been given our assignment. It's nobody else's. Some may have similar assignments, some may have some that sound, but we have our assignment. Our ins assignment includes Haiti. Our assignment includes Israel. Our assignment includes the word of faith. Our assignment includes understanding our Jewish roots and making that known wherever we can by whatever voice we can make it. Our assignment includes stepping up and living out the kingdom of God. And so we all gather, and there we're presented to Yeshua, and not only has he said to us individually, but now he says, Tribe of Fitchburg, I say to you, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your master. I'm so excited for what you did. That's a we experience. That's a we experience. Paul was so hungry for a we experience for his own people, he said, if I thought it would help, if I could give up my own salvation to see all of you get in, I would do it. You know, we don't want to get there and be standing before Yeshua. And he says, Pastor, well done, good and faithful. Pastor Donna, well good and done, you know, great. And thank you that you carried out your assignment. Come on into the joy of your master. Well, well, Lord, there's joy, but remember, it's not all I. Amen. There, there's no joy without you. That's true. There's no kind of be any joy. Oh, yes, we preached a thousand sermons and held so many dinners and we, we had great celebrations at the old mill and where are the people? Where are the people? But see, I don't believe that's going to happen. <laughs> you know, because if we got to drag, we will. If we got to pull you out of the seats and pull you up and then put you in places and say, all right, and then get you there and say, preach! <laughs> we'll do it. You can go ahead and sit down, because otherwise he'll preach. <laughs> he's, he's ready to preach. Why? How many times? How many times, Pastor? How many times is somebody going to mess up in, 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 in their life, and you're going to say, done, finished, no more of you? Never. Now, you might come to a point where you're so messed up, you can't walk in harmony with us. You can't walk in fellowship with us. And you're out there. We're always praying for you. Amen. And if three years later you come in, you know, your head's down, and you say, Pastor, I just messed up and didn't listen to you and did everything, and I've just been, I, I need to get back to God. You're going to find arms around you, hugging you, pick your head up and say, get your head up, get your head up, and come back into the family. Amen. And we'll put a new robe around you, and we'll continue to walk together. Because God's going to, I believe, reward tribes. 
And this is the tribe we got. And I never knew that in life. You know, I was a pastor, went from one church to another church to another church, another church, and, you know, and churches, we have you for pastor, we don't like you anymore, bye. Get a new pastor, you know, whatever. What about a family? What about a family? <laughs> and to see him look at the family and say, you know, you finally got it together. You finally learned how to love one another, and you finally learned how to, to ignore each other's idiosyncrasies. Your flesh. <laughs> you know, you finally got to see through all the, whatever the personality was to the, the heart of the, of the, and soul of a person to their, to their spirit man and you rejoiced together and you were able to put down differences and you were able to move forward and, and therefore you became open enough to embrace people outside your comfort zone. And you became one family who loves me. That's what you do. You love me. You love me. Faith is given as much of you as you know to as much of God as you know. You can't give parts of you you don't even know exist yet. <laughs> Our job is to make sure you know they exist. You need to change that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Amen? To as much of God as you know. And that's our job is then to help you understand how much more God is that he gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in your mind every time you walk in here. Another facet of God till we worship together, rejoice together, give together, sit around the sukkah together, eat our meals together, do everything, and we're aware God is here. God is here. And Yeshua will say, I've been waiting for this family to get up to here as a family together. Now watch, during the millennium, what I can do. We've got members of our family who are already there, you know. Doris is already there. Glory to God. Ashley's already there. I can just see her up there. Yeah, Dad. Yeah, Dad, wait. You don't even know what it's going to be like, Dad. I'm up here. Wait, wait till you see when you get up here. And, and we're not going to get up there and say, um, excuse me, Angel, Ashley, do, do you know where Ashley is? Oh, I think she's a thousand miles that way up on the 332nd floor in the city of Jerusalem. <laughs> Come on. They're called a great cloud of witnesses, which means they are witnessing our lives, which means when it's our time to go, they're going to know that we're coming. And if it's the end time and it's a great rapture of the church, we're they're going to be up there in masses. Hey, over here, over here. I tell people, if you get lost, we're all going to meet at the Middle Eastern Gate. <laughs> okay, so in the New Jerusalem, you know, we're all going to gather at the middle of the three Eastern Gates, the Middle Eastern Gate. Now, I've told several congregations that, so there'll be a large group meeting at the Middle <laughs> Eastern Gate. But don't bother looking at the Damascus Gate for us. We're going to be at the Middle Eastern Gate. That's where we're going to have our reunion. Do you get anything out of this? Say, say, what is it all about? You count. Your voice counts. Your vote counts. Your participation counts. Your life counts. You only have one life to live. Live it for him. Amen. Do you get anything out of this today? Stand up on your feet and receive the blessing of the Lord. Father, we do thank you and praise you for your love for us. We thank you for this message that Holy Spirit quickened into our lives today. We thank you that we, we do count. Our voice counts. Our life counts. All about us counts. Thank you, Abba, that you have given talents to us, and therefore you believe we have the full potential to release those talents to see them multiply all around us. And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Holy One of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, our God, our Father, may He bless you, may He fill your life to overflowing, may He empower you to walk this week stronger than you've ever walked before, eyes seen clearer than you've ever seen before, empowered to be truly an ambassador for Christ in this world, in Yeshua's name. And God's people said, Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm sure glad I was here today.